Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you guys are doing well. For those who are new to my channel, my name is Harold and you can also call me Faradaus, that is my Muslim name. And for those who have been here before, welcome back. We have uploaded a new video and I hope you like this one. But before we begin, I'd just like to wish all my dear Muslim brothers and sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. So today what I'll be sharing with you is 11 things that I didn't know about Islam before I became a Muslim. You also come to find that only touching briefly on each of these points as some of these points may require a separate video done for them entirely due to the nature of the topic and the need for me to elaborate further. But before we continue, I'd just like to ask that you support my channel by hitting the subscribe and the like button and turning on your notifications so that you get informed as soon as a new video is up. It's totally free and it takes less than a minute. So without further ado, now on to the 11 things that I do not know about Islam before becoming a Muslim. Point number one, before I became a Muslim, I didn't know the difference between religion and culture. Coming from Singapore, I've always seen Malays practicing the religion and due to my ignorance, I thought that Islam came from the Malays when actually Islam came from the Middle East and it was the Arabs who shared about the religion to the rest of the world. Therefore, I had the misconception and thought that when I converted, I was converting to be a Malay. It's not right because that would mean that I'm converting to another race. There's a lot of practices in the religion which is separate from the culture. So you can be a Chinese, an Indian or any other race and you can still embrace the religion and bring your culture in it as long as it doesn't go against the rulings of Islam. Point number two, the concept of God in Islam. So coming from my past as a Catholic, I used to go to church and I see many images, statues and some people wearing crucifixes. But for the Muslims, God does not have an image and that no one has ever seen God. For when Muslims worship, they do not have an image of God. And in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, God, specifically describes himself. That is Surah Al-Ikhlas verse 1 to 4. A'uzu billahi minash shaitanir rajim Bismillahir rahmanir rahim Qul huwa Allahu ahad Allahu samad lam yalid wa lam yulad wa lam yakul lahu kufuwan ahad so basically what it's saying is that say that Allah is one and only, the eternal and the absolute, that he neither begets nor is begotten, means he doesn't give birth to nor is he being given birth to, and that nothing in this world and the universe is comparable to him. And that is the gist of the concept of God in Islam. Point number three, prayer in Islam. Before I became Muslim, when I was a Catholic, you can pray anytime and we just have to close our eyes, put our hands together and just start a prayer. But for the Muslims, although they can do that as well, there is actually a formal structure to how they should pray. And the first thing is taking the ablution, which is to clean themselves, to purify their body and also to keep their mind and their thoughts purified before they start doing any prayers. Uh, and the next thing about prayer is that the Muslim prayers are all in Arabic. Previously when I was ignorant about Islam, uh, I used to think the prayers were in Malay. As I live in Singapore, the impression is that most of the Malays are Muslims and therefore you can be any race and you still have to do your prayers in Arabic. This also has to be done without any interruptions, otherwise they'll have to do their prayers all over again and that means they have to stay in focus while praying. And the last thing about prayer that I came to find quite interesting was the benefits of praying. By doing it five times at different times of the day, it helps a Muslim to have a more balanced life between their work life and worshipping God. And given that their prayers are mandatory, Muslims have a structure in their life. And prayers for Muslims, besides seeking help, is also to seek God's mercy and to be grateful for all the things that He has blessed them. As Allah mentioned in the Quran, in chapter 2, Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 152 and 153. <laughs>
So basically what it says is that Allah is saying, So remember me, I will remember you. And be grateful to me and do not deny me. O oh, you who have believed, seek help through prayer and patience. And indeed, Allah is with those who are patient. Point number four, that is obligatory for Muslim men to perform their Friday prayers. Previously, before I became Muslim, I didn't know about this because I thought both men and women had to go to the mosque on Friday to do their prayers. But instead, women are encouraged to go, but they do not have to. It's not a requirement for them. And this also includes an exception for children, a sick person, or even a slave. Point number five, the concept of halal food in Islam. So previously, I always thought that Muslims are only not allowed to eat pork. But as I come to learn more about the religion, I find that it's not just the pork, but this entire process of how the animal is reared in an ethical and proper way to how they're being slaughtered before it comes to our plate. This entire process is required. Even all the other meat, chicken and beef and lamb, requires a proper way of slaughtering. Only then can the meat be considered halal. Point number six. The concept of fasting during the time of Ramadan. So previously I thought, you know, Muslim fast, they just don't eat food. But actually, they also don't drink during the period of fasting. And fasting itself is not just about eating or drinking, but it's also about purifying their thoughts, their actions, their intentions, their heart and their mind. Uh, as it is a holy month for the Muslims because it was during the time when the first verse of the Quran was recited from Allah to Prophet Muhammad wasallam, peace be and blessings be upon him, through the angel Gabriel, Jibrail. And Muslims all around the world would start fasting, purify themselves and do more recitations of the Quran and a lot more prayers during this time. They also practice a lot of charity and ask for forgiveness from each other. So what I find interesting when I came to know more about fasting in Islam is that you know there's so many things that Muslims look out for during this time to purify themselves and renew their heart and soul. Point number seven, gender segregation in Islam. So previously when I was a Catholic, uh, when I go to church, men and women could be in the same congregation worshipping God. But as I come to know and understand more about Islam, gender segregation is very important in order to remain focused in their prayer. It's not just the prayers in the mosque. During classes, men and women will be separated. And even in a social setting, Muslim men will not come into body contact with any women, like shaking hands. Point number eight, the belief in angels, genes, and all the prophets. I didn't know at the time as a Catholic that there are a lot of angels that we share in common with the Muslims. For example, the Muslims also have the angel Michael, which is Mikhail, and the angel Gabriel, which is Jibrail, and they have to believe in these angels as well. Besides angels, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala also mentioned that He created genes, which are spirits, basically spirits that we can't see, and they're made from smokeless fire. Besides genes, Muslims also have to believe in all the prophets from the time of Adam, Abraham, the prophet Noah, Moses, and even Jesus, peace and blessings be upon them, to the last prophet, Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, peace and blessings be upon him. And therefore, it was a big surprise for me to come to find that Muslims also have to believe in Jesus, peace and blessings be upon him, as one of the prophets that were sent by Allah to mankind. Point number nine, although Muslim men can take up to four wives, it is recommended in the Quran that they should only take one wife unless they could do justice to all four of them. What this basically means, if they were to have four wives and they were to give a monthly allowance to the wife, all four wives should be given the same amount. Besides money, there are also other aspects that they have to be treated justly as well, such as the food and the house that they possess and the amount of time spent with each of these women. Point number 10, the difference between Hadith and the Quran. So before I became a Muslim, I always got confused with when people are quoting things about Islam. And, and that got me really confused because the Holy Scriptures are basically found in the Quran, which is given from God through the angel Gabriel to Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, peace and blessings be upon him. And therefore the Quran is believed to be the exact words from God. Uh, whereas the hadiths are collections of acts and sayings of the Prophet. There are a total of 2,200 hadiths 
with six canonical hadiths. And these six hadiths are known authentic ones. They are Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, Sunan al shukra Sunan Abu Dawud, Jami al tirmizi and Sunan Ibn Majah. And each of these hadiths have varying depth of collection. In the top two, Sahih Muslim and Sahih Bukhari, have over 7,000 collections of the actions and sayings of the Prophet Muhammad wasallam. Peace and blessings be upon him. And now to the final point, point number 11, the oppression of women. As you know, in the Western media, women in Islam are seen to be oppressed as depicted that they have to always have the head covered and to be dressed modestly. And for this point, who else is the best person to give you a perspective on this other than my wife? Hello, so yeah, we're back here and here's my wife. She'll be sharing about oppression of women in Islam. What do you think about that? Do you think, do you think the West is right in <laughs> depicting that? No, of course not. Do I do oppressed to you? <laughs> do I sound oppressed? Hi guys, by the way. Yeah. Um, Introduce yourself. Yeah, so uh, my name is Shah, uh, Shahira, Shahira in full. Uh, we've been married for what? Four years now? Four years? Four and a half years? Yeah. Yeah, thereabouts, four and a half years. Well, the thing is, a lot of people think that the, the cloth on my head is actually a sign of oppression. Uh, it really is not. Uh, the reason why I put on the I mean, what I put on the hijab is really because, um, you know, God tells us to cover up. And um, it's not because I feel like I'm obligated to, to do it or like my husband is like forcing me to do it. In fact, actually for the first couple of years when we were married, um, I was not, I haven't done the hijab yet at that point. Um, and it was only because I came to a point of realization that I needed to wear it and I wanted to wear it and that's why I decided to wear it. So what people also don't know is that um, Islam speaks very highly of women. Uh, we are not considered as like second to men. In fact, all human beings are um, equal. Um, and it's just that we play different roles, very much different roles in this world. But it doesn't mean that the man is always like ahead of the woman or, you know, vice versa. We are all equals in the eyes of the Lord, right? So I don't think I'm being oppressed. I mean, I was given equal opportunities all the time. Um, more. Slightly. What? Slightly more opportunities. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but... Uh, but uh, people have this misconception that because you're different, uh, you're being oppressed. And the thing is, what people also don't realize is that in the Quran, there's actually a whole chapter that is dedicated to women. Surah An Nisa. Uh, it talks about the status of women, how women should be taken care of, and all the things with regards to women and how high the status of women are uh, in the eyes of God as well. So. I think that the whole women are being oppressed um, issue is just not real. Although there are of course biases, but it doesn't just apply to Muslim women. I think in life, so long as you dress differently from everyone, you don't conform to the norms, at the societal norms, people think that you're being oppressed just because you have to cover up. But you think about it back then when women are told to cover up to sort of protect themselves, like in terms of their modesty and the gaze um, of men. And from the gaze of men. And actually, in all honesty, that is really to protect men from making women an object of, of desire. desire. Um, having said that, in today's context, as I mentioned earlier, like we have different roles to play. It doesn't mean that I do the household means I'm oppressed. Like I have to stay in the kitchen, but actually in this household, he does most of the housework. Um, and I'm very blessed and grateful for a husband like him because he helps me with almost everything in the house. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, women, we just have different roles from men. It doesn't mean that we are oppressed. And I don't see the, the way I dress as a sign of oppression. In fact, the reason why I don't this is really because of my relationship with God and it has nothing to do with people telling me to do so. You know, I've had I've had a few uh, occasions where people tell me like, Hey Sha, why don't you why don't you dress like other people do, you know? People see you as different and things like that. So when you take a look at it from that perspective, I think that is oppression. Like why should I conform to your norms? Or why should I conform to you to the societal norms? Like what like just because you think it's normal and for me to blend in, I have to do that. That 
in itself to me yeah. is an oppression yeah. the fact that I am able to dress the way I want to to make a choice uh, in the things that I do that's a sign of freedom I think so so yeah so I mean yeah honestly do I really look oppressed no right but yeah so so yeah so, so, so in conclusion I don't think women in Islam are oppressed and the term oppressed shouldn't be used at all in, in the religious context because really in Islam, women are very much liberated um, and celebrated as well. So, yeah. so that's all for the 11 points of uh, what I did not know about Islam before I became Muslims. And I hope you enjoyed this video. And to my dear brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Remember to like and subscribe and also to hit the notification button. And we'll see you again in the next video. Bye. Bye.